So let's start with an anterior view in the anatomic position. Um, so obviously the palmar surface of the hand, a lot of uh, orthopedists will also use the term volar, say the volar surface, which is essentially the palmar surface, uh, just to make it difficult for you guys. So um, we have the uh, radial and ulnar side, again, to make it more confusing for everybody. So this is the radial side. So on the radial side of the hand, uh, the wrist, you're going to palpate the radial styloid. Now, a lot of people miss, um, well, or the distal radius and the radial styloid. A lot of people will um, misname as the radial head. The radial head technically is in the elbow and the distal radius and on the radial aspect of the distal radius, the uh, radial styloid is at the distal end of the radius and that's palpable right here. Um, we talked about anatomic snuff box in the uh, clinical video, which is here. The ulnar, uh, ulnar styloid is here. Of course, the metacarpals are uh, palpable. Um, on the um, volar surface of the hand, we often uh, uh, talk about uh, assessing the thenar and hypothenar eminence, and this becomes important when looking at nerve compression um, syndromes. Um, so the uh, let's get uh, let's get down past the skin layer here. So again, the radial styloid is prominent on the radial side of the wrist right here, um, and the uh, ulnar styloid on the ulnar side of the wrist. So these are some of the bony landmarks around the wrist. Now the carpal bones themselves a little bit harder to really get a finger on. Uh, you can palpate them. It's a little difficult sometimes to identify exactly what you're palpating other than perhaps the pisiform. Uh, again, hypothenar and thenar eminence uh, muscle masses are often visible, palpable. And just remember with a lot of orthopedic um, assessment, you always want to compare to the contralateral side. So you'll assess um, muscle bulk, for instance, compared to the contralateral side. So um, you know, the, the hand and wrist really, there's obviously bony anatomy, but it's all about really the, the the tendons, right? So the hand is a functional unit. So we think a lot about the tendons. Let's start on the extensor side of the wrist. So on the extensor side of the wrist, we think about these compartments. So you got the um, abductor pollicis longus, the extensor pollicis brevis all the way over here. Then you have the extensor carpi radialis uh, longus and the extensor carpi radialis brevis. Okay, these are wrist extensors. Okay, whereas the first compartment there acts on the thumb. And in between, actually the first, second, third dorsal compartment is the extensor pollicis longus, right? So of course this extends the thumb. Let's get some fun thumb extension uh, shown there, all right? So that that uh, provides, it's a long extensor for the thumb. But one thing, one thing you can see is that um, this is what forms your anatomic snuff box right here, right? And what's in the middle of the anatomic snuff box? The scaphoid. And we talk about that in the other video. Uh, and then as you come across into your fourth dorsal compartment, you have your extensor digitorum longus, um, and then keep coming across, you got your extensor digiti minimi or digiti quinti, and then the extensor carpi ulnaris, which is another wrist extensor on the ulnar side of the wrist, right? So let's uh, let's come around now and uh, come onto the volar or, or palmar surface. So here the tendons are a little bit harder to um, sort of like localize in space. Most of them are bunched up, right? Now you do have the uh, flexor carpi radialis, and this is an important surgical landmark. Now it's a flexor of the wrist, right? So not to sort of, you know, leave that out. You can see, of course, is a main flexor of the wrist, so the flexor carpi radialis, and then the flexor carpi uh, ulnaris provides some um, wrist flexion as well. But beyond that, most of your tendons, your flexor digitorum superficialis, and flexor digitorum profundus, these are all um, deep structures within the carpal tunnel. Okay, I'm not gonna get too much into carpal tunnel anatomy. This is really more about functional anatomy and surface anatomy. Uh, but uh, of course, understanding you know your deeper structures and cross section there is important. Um, so here are your long flexors, and we can see 
that uh, they provide finger flexion, right? But you can see what they insert. They insert pretty distal, right? Let's just bring that into, into view a little bit better. Uh, as opposed to the um, flexor digitorum superficialis, right? Which also provides, you can see a little bit of wrist flexion, but also provides finger flexion. Sorry for the position there. But you can see they actually insert onto the middle segment, right? The middle phalanx. Now, I'm not going to go through, try to attempt to show all the functional exam maneuvers. This is something you'll need to learn. Um, I go over it a little bit in the video, uh, understanding um, you know, flexion, what is intrinsic function versus extrinsic function. So this is some of the anatomy that you'll just need to sort of practice and learn. There's also pulley systems here uh, that um, you'll need to understand. So, um, so that's some of the basic surface and functional anatomy uh, in the hand without going through every single uh, muscle, but uh, I think that covers some of the basics, especially with the extrinsic uh, tendons, which I think are a little bit more straightforward to, uh, to understand. So let's move on to some of the intrinsic muscles. So here you can see your dorsal interossei, right? So what do they provide, right? These are intrinsic muscles. So they provide adduction, right? Adduction. And um, a lot of times if we're testing for, let's say, uh, ulnar nerve function, right? We'll often test adduction, right? Now you have another peculiar muscle called the lumbricals, right? So what do the lumbricals perform? The lumbricals actually perform finger flexion at the MCP joints. So this is so-called intrinsic flexion. So if you, in order for you to be able to flex at the MCP joints and keep the fingers extended, like this position, you need intrinsic function. And a little, it's a little again, a little complicated exactly how that works, but uh, that is sort of a demonstration of that intrinsic flexion. Uh, if you noticed in contradistinction, if you rewind, you'll see extrinsic flexion where the long flexors flexes, you know, the fingers at the DIP and PIP joints, depending on which tendon you're looking at. Uh, and these are often isolated in order to best identify them. So with a hand and wrist, um, a lot of uh, bony landmarks you need to be aware of. Also, just keep in mind uh, where you, you know where the hand is positioned. Uh, this is pronation. This is supination. Um, the uh, wrist. The major bony landmarks are going to be the uh, uh, ulnar head, the distal ulnar right here, which usually forms a pretty reasonable bony prominence. Uh, the distal radius, which uh, obviously um, uh, has a little bit of a bony prominence as as well. Um, and can be a site of uh, tenderness. It's a frequently injured bone as well. Um, so in the wrist, uh, approximately those are your two major landmarks. The carpal bones themselves are a little bit harder to palpate. Uh, the scaphoid can be accessed through the so-called anatomical snuff box. If you bring your thumb up, you can see the sensor pollicis longus tendon uh, popping up here. And if I go into this spacer, I'm actually pressing right up against the um, scaphoid bone itself. So you're sort of trying to identify if there's scaphoid bone tenderness, like a scaphoid fracture. This is one way you can isolate onto the scaphoid itself. Um, other bony landmarks in the hand, you should just identify where the metacarpals are uh, in the hand, metacarpophalangeal joints, proximal interphalangeal joints, distal interphalangeal joints. In the thumb, there's only one interphalangeal joint and um, bring the hand over this way. Um, some of the soft tissue uh, landmarks you should be aware of are the thenar and hypothenar eminence. And these are a group of what we call intrinsic muscles uh, that um, the main reason to identify this and compare it to the other side is that if there's nerve injury, a chronic nerve injury, sometimes these muscles can get denervated and might appear flatter than normal. So on the uh, volar or anterior part of the wrist, um, 
you know, there's certainly quite a few tendons, uh, the um, long flexors of the uh, fingers. Uh, you also have the uh, median nerve. The median nerve is gonna run uh, right in this direction and then into the uh, carpal tunnel of the hand. And again, this is an area where patients can get uh, compression of the nerve and that can lead to compression neuropathy. Uh, one of the tendons that's present in some patients but not all is the palmaris longus. So the palmaris longus is a, is a small muscle that forms a very superficial tendon uh, that inserts superficially in the hand. So uh, if you want to identify if there is a palmaris longus, which I think I can feel here, but if you really want to know, you're going to ask the patient to literally do this motion, and then you look to see if a tendon pops up. And I believe that in this case, there is indeed a palmaris longus there. Because the fact is, it is not present in every patient. Um, clinically, uh, it's not of huge clinical importance in terms of injuries and uh, assessing disease, uh, but the palmaris longus is a tendon actually that can sometimes be used as tendon uh, graft or donor graft, and it's important to know whether it's actually there or not. So in addition to looking for tendon pathology and tendon injury, uh, you may want to focus specifically on uh, nerve uh, function in the hand. Um, so uh, a, a very quick exam uh, to be able to do this uh, is to check the radial, median, and ulnar nerves. So one way we check for uh, uh, radial nerve function is literally just to ask the patient to bring the thumb all the way back, and if they can fully extend the thumb, uh, and we see that extensor pulse is longest uh, firing. We feel that we have good radial nerve function uh, in the forearm uh, to check sensation. Usually gonna check in this vicinity along the thumb and the dorsal first web space here. So if there's numbness here compared to the other side, uh, you worry about maybe a radial nerve injury. Um, to check for ulnar nerve function, we're gonna check for motor function by having them try to cross the fingers or abduct and adduct, but crossing the fingers is a good one. When there's swelling, this can be difficult. And then for ulnar sensation, we're looking for any numbness in the distribution of the, of the ulnar nerve. So the ulnar nerve distribution is gonna be on the volar and dorsal hand, usually involving uh, the ulnar side of the hand, all of the little finger, and about half, literally half of the, of the uh, ring finger, the ulnar side. Uh, so if there's any numbness along here or here, uh, we worry about uh, ulnar nerve injury. And then finally, the median nerve. Uh, median nerve, we check for uh, motor function oftentimes by asking them to uh, do what we call an AOK -okay sign, and you're looking to see does the patient have, and can make an appropriate uh, uh, circle here that they can actually keep the uh, thumb bent and the finger bent, and they're not like falling down like this. So here we know we have um, uh, good uh, function of the median nerve and inter interosseous nerve. Uh, to check sensation in the median nerve, usually we're checking for sensation in the long finger and index finger. Technically, it does go onto the radial side of the uh, ring finger as well, but uh, sensory uh, dysfunction in this area would make you worried about the median nerve. So radial, ulnar, median nerve, sensory, and um, simple motor function exam.